I'm Kerry Colin E.C., and I am the uh, director of the Penn Program on Regulation and a member of the faculty here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And it's my uh, privilege today to introduce and moderate our panel discussion. Uh, today's panel session is sponsored by the Penn Program on Regulation, as well as the Law School Center for Technology uh, Competition and Innovation. And I want to note at the outset with appreciation the efforts of Andy Coopersmith and Anna Gavin, who put today's session together on only a few days uh, notice after President Obama, President Biden, excuse me, issued his 20 page uh, executive order on promoting competition in the American economy uh, just last Friday. Uh, President Biden's executive order comes at what seems to be a major inflection point in US policy related to uh, business and government relations to competition in the economy. Uh, although uh, we do obviously live in a highly polarized political climate, uh, there seems to be bipartisan support to take some action against at least big tech companies. Uh, while not everything in the Biden executive order uh, has bipartisan support and not everything in it will deal with big tech, I think the, it's fair to say that the order does respond to a larger uh, undercurrent calling for change in the rules of the game of the economy. Uh, in the United States. Uh, in announcing uh, his executive order, for example, President Biden captured that prevailing zeitgeist when he said that capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. And he continued that without healthy competition, big players can change and charge uh, whatever they want and treat you however they want. So uh, what does, uh, Biden's executive order do? Uh, what does it mean? That's what we're here gathered to talk about today. In brief, uh, the order creates a new White House Council on Competition uh, that will oversee the order's call for 72 different actions to be taken by over a dozen agencies aiming to fulfill the order's purpose of, quote, promoting the interest of American workers, businesses, and consumers. Uh, by, uh, quote, uh, 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 ensuring a, a fair, open, and competitive marketplace. We won't cover all aspects, all 72 uh, uh, facets of this executive order in the next hour. Uh, much of the order does address uh, and concern antitrust policy, invigorating enforcement, reconsidering merger guidelines, putting a spotlight on non-compete clauses and employment, but much has to do with a much broader set of issues related to what might be thought of as consumer protection. Just to give you a sampling of the range of issues and items that are addressed in this executive order, let me list off some of these meat labeling, seed patents, craft breweries, uh, the internet and net neutrality, landlords being able to uh, dictate the in internet service providers of their renters, uh, baggage fees by airlines, drone delivery by retailers, performance standards for uh, passenger railroads, hearing aids, uh, generic drug pricing, uh, procurement policy at the Department of Defense, uh, FinTech, and even uh, regulatory analysis itself. So a broad range of issues, all captured under the theme of restructuring uh, competition. And uh, this executive order enters a scene that's already showing signs of impending policy shifts and legal change. Over 35 states have filed a lawsuit uh, on antitrust grounds against Google. The Federal Trade Commission, under a new chair, has uh, abandon its longstanding consumer welfare-based test for its rulemakings and made procedural moves to uh, signal that it will be prepared to move more swiftly on a wider range of issue. A lot ultimately is in the works. And fortunately, to make sense of it all, uh, we have today three distinguished panel members. Uh, Herbert Hovenkamp is the James 
a Dynan professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and at the Wharton School. Uh, in addition to being a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, he is, as a new book about his scholarship is aptly entitled, The Dean of American Antitrust Law. Uh, we also have uh, John Thin Click, a professor of law here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, uh, who also holds the Erasmus Chair of Empirical Legal Studies at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. He is a leading empirical economist uh, who studies legal and regulatory change. And finally, Joanna Marinescu uh, is a tenured member of the faculty and associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, she studies the labor market and uh, has a great deal of focus on antitrust issues related to the labor market. So I'm looking forward to their comments. And to get us started, I wanted to ask and invite each of them to focus on different facets of what might be thought of as the problem that the executive order is aiming to address. And uh, Herb, if I can ask you first to comment on uh, you know, President Biden's own remarks when announcing the executive order, uh, he said that we're now 40 years into the experiment of letting giant corporations accumulate more and more power. And what have we gotten from it? Less growth, weakened investment, fewer small businesses, too many Americans who feel left behind, too many people who are poorer than their parents. President Biden said, I believe the experiment failed. Do you agree? Well, um, yes. What President Biden is referring to is kind of the great neoliberal experiment uh, of the 1980s. Uh, we associate it sometimes with President Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and antitrust with Robert Bork. Uh, and what he said is used to be controversial. I think it's become less controversial. Uh, the evidence that the uh, executive order cites for this lessening of dynamism or competition is based on concentration data. Uh, and interestingly, not too many people use that data anymore. Uh, it's census data. It's a very poor surrogate for uh, antitrust markets. And as a result, it doesn't measure concentration all that well. Uh, most of the modern macroeconomic data attempts to uh, look at price cost margins. Uh, interestingly, it comes to about the same set of conclusions, which is that there's more and more markup, more and more monopoly in the economy. And one thing the markup data can do that the concentration data do not do is they can kind of take it apart and ask where the excessive returns are going. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that the share of labor in uh, this growing profitability it has actually gotten smaller and smaller so that the welfare of labor has gone down. Uh, consistent with that then, uh, the executive order promotes a number of things. Uh, and I think some of them are quite good, particularly more aggressive merger policy, uh, more aggressive use of uh, uh, injunctions against anti-competitive restraints. One thing that surprised me a little bit is that uh, while this was widely touted as a, as a uh, progressive document, the fact is that it preserves the centrality of economic concerns uh, in antitrust. It never speaks of political power uh, as an antitrust concern. It applies somewhat more aggressive economics to the concerns. Uh, but the closest it comes to making a statement, I'll read it to you, uh, that has anything to do with politics is from a very famous old 1957 uh, antitrust case statement by Justice Black, uh, which says the Sherman Act rests on the premise that the unrestrained interaction of competitive forces will yield the best allocation of our economic resources, lowest prices, highest quality and greatest material progress, while at the same time providing an environment conducive to the preservation 
of our democratic, political, and social institutions. Well, Frederick Hayek or Milton Friedman could have said that statement and probably agreed with it. So I think we remain in, the, in an era in which economic concerns are going to dominate antitrust. There's no license in, uh, in, in this statement for uh, the agencies to depart from that model. However, I do anticipate uh, that the economics that they apply is going to be more interventionist more based on imperfect competition models rather than the perfect competition models that guided so much of uh, Chicago school thinking in the 1980s and so. Uh, and as a result, at least at the sort of atmospheric level, I, uh, I favor what the executive order is attempting to do. Okay, great. And Professor Marinescu, I mean, another aspect of the justification that President Biden put forward for this executive order is a lack of competition in labor markets. And he, he noted in his opening remarks, introducing the order and before signing it, uh, quote, in many communities, there are only a handful of employers left competing for workers. Uh, and uh, he continued that when corporations have that kind of leverage over workers, it pushes down wages. Uh, businesses don't feel the pressure to innovate or invest in their workforce. Uh, what is the state of competition in labor markets today and how accurate is the underlying uh, you know, prognosis here that uh, President Biden has put forward? So yes, indeed. So first, let me say that uh, we do know that a lot of labor markets are plagued by a low level of competition. So in particular, the majority or 60% of US labor markets we have shown have a herpindel hirschman index above the threshold that would place them into a high concentration uh, area. According to the horizontal merger guidelines, in other terms, there's little competition. Now, a lot of those markets are in less densely populated zones, but even after you weigh by population, still about 20% of US workers work uh, in markets that are highly uh, concentrated. So, you know, just to zoom out and following uh, up on uh, Herb's remarks, you know, what is the problem here? I think the bigger problem that for the worker side that this is trying to address is that we've seen wage stagnation for most workers since the 1980s with very limited uh, real wage growth. And so uh, the president here is seizing on the moment to uh, have an instrument here, antitrust policy that has a chance to increase wages. Um, and, and why is that the case? Well, it turns out that in fact, there is limited competition in the labor market. You know, I already told you about concentration, but we can look at this just like Herb was saying about price cost margins. We can look at the wage markdown. So just as when we have monopoly power, we have prices that are too high relative to cost. Similarly, when we have monopsony or employer power, we have wages that are too low relative to the marginal productivity of labor, or in other terms, the contribution of workers to firms' bottom line. And so we, uh, in a recent paper, we've been looking at those uh, margins using uh, data from online search data, and we showed that indeed workers have the power to pay, uh, sorry, employers have the power to pay workers less than their productivity because workers are only somewhat sensitive to wages. In other terms, they have little opportunities to go to other jobs and are willing to accept to be paid less uh, than uh, their marginal productivity. And so there is a significant markdown, uh, therefore, in the labor market and other work by colleagues using different strategies concurs in showing uh, the existence of this markdown. Quite amusingly, this includes the higher education sector where universities have power over us professors um, and would be able to impose such a markdown. Then uh, let me get back to merger policy and so what's the evidence that uh, it relates to the issue of mergers. So I said before that high concentration is quite prevalent in US labor markets. And as the president said, this leads to lower wages. And this is what we have shown in one of my papers that as concentration increases in a labor market, it tends to depress wages. Now, you know, this is one way of looking at the, the issue and it might mask some complex phenomena. So there are a bunch of papers, in fact, a couple of strong papers in economics looking at specifically the impact of mergers 
And what these papers show using a broad range of industries, and one of them focuses on hospitals particularly, which is an area where Biden has a bunch of things to say about hospitals. In any case, the results are consistent in showing that mergers that greatly increase labor market concentration are those that also significantly suppress wages. And so I think this is a, an interesting uh, confirmation of the relevance of the current order in terms of thinking about ways uh, how we can increase workers' wages by beefing up antitrust enforcement. And we can talk more about what they propose later. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's great. And, and let me uh, turn to uh, John now and ask you as an empirical economist, uh, if you can offer some insight about another aspect of the uh, problem statement that uh, President Biden issued in which he said that if you take into account rising prices and the stagnant wages, the lack of competition costs the median American household $5,000 a year. I assume that's uh, in, in some kind of opportunity cost that I, I am not actually paying out 5,000, but maybe uh, uh, the, the median household that supposedly, if this statistic is right, uh, is not getting as much out of the, uh, the economy as it would if there were more uh, competition. Uh, any insights about this or the overall picture uh, about the problem that the order is aiming at? Yeah, I guess before talking about the empirical side of things, um, just as a big picture policy issue, you know, it's interesting, decades ago, um, the Nobel Prize winner, Jan Tinbergen, um, had sort of a rule of thumb where he said, if you have one policy target, you should have one policy, right? The idea being, once you start looking at 10 different policy targets for a given policy, things go awry. Um, and so, you know, we're sort of at a, at a point where it seems as though we're moving in the direction away from using uh, competition law, using antitrust law to focus on one thing, the so-called consumer welfare standard um, that we've sort of used in this 40-year experiment that, uh, that Herb and the Biden administration are declaring a failure. I, I don't exactly see it that way, uh, but we're almost moving in the opposite direction of the Tinbergen rule. Um, let's have you know everything under the sun now as part of antitrust uh, antitrust regulation. Um, so I you know I just think sort of conceptually that may be problematic, and I'll come back to that. But to um, to talk specifically about some of the empirics here, um, the Biden administration's uh, uh, citation of the five thousand dollar sort of loss um, comes from work by by Thomas uh, Thomas Philippin, um, and and the book uh, that it comes from it's called The Great Reversal. Um, got a lot of attention in sort of the antitrust uh, circles and, and more broadly covered by many of newspapers and things like that. Problem is, um, and, and granted, it's, it's, a, it's a book, not an academic paper, although it, it's, it purports to be academic. The problem is um, that $5,000 number is, is sort of, as you suggested, smushing together lots of stuff. As an empiricist, it's hard to figure out sort of one thing well and with confidence, much less to sort of smush a bunch of stuff together. And if you walk through um, the, the Philippon book, um, a lot of his most sort of striking examples of, of the, the US uh, concentration leading us to, as consumers to pay a lot more and, and, and as workers to get a lot less um, become really problematic. So in, in a lot of the op-eds and coverage uh, uh, by and, and of Philippon, he, he liked to cite his example of you know, his parents or when he goes back to France, you know, he can, he can pay a lot less for his internet um, and, and cell phone coverage and things like that um, than he does here in the U.S. And if you follow through on the footnotes, he, he luckily he does have sort of the citation for the data. The problem is, is most of the time, it's an apples to oranges comparison. So in fact, on the, on the internet uh, package uh, uh, number that he cites, it is, is indeed the case that the, that the data that he cites suggests that the average payment for uh, broadband, for example, in the U.S. is about twice as high in the U.S. as it is in France and Germany. But then when you drill down on the data, it turns out that the U.S. Uh, data is for a much faster package. And so when you do it, say, for on a, on a megabit uh, basis, it turns out that per megabit, the U.S. consumers pay about half 
of what the what the folks in in France and Germany pay. Um, and then, sort of, not coincidentally, it turns out that sort of folks in the U.S. at least report and, and through the data actually use their internet uh, package a lot more. Favor this point about internet, but it but it does raise a, a, a tricky point in a lot of these kinds of comparisons, um, particularly uh, country to country, time period to time period, but even sort of maybe industry to industry. Um, when we're doing these comparisons, we really do need to make sure that we're sort of comparing the same kind of stuff. And that's not so easy to do, right? Um, and, and so if, if we're kind of serious about that, it's much harder to make these sort of claims about U.S. antitrust policy or increasing concentration has led to X more dollars being spent by, by folks in the U.S. On a similar note, you know, it's interesting if, if folks in the U.S. over this time period have been made so much worse off by the increasing concentration. Um, it is interesting if you go to sort of uh, consumption data, um, you know, collected by the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and whatnot. One of the things that's quite interesting is your um, uh, failure, you know, failed time uh, experiment. Um, U.S. consumers are actually consuming a lot more than, than they certainly were at the beginning. Now, you might say, well, of course, we should have progress and things like that. Um, but of a sort of a $5,000 loss, it, it ought to show up in sort of obvious um, welfare metrics and welfare hits. And, and it's really hard to find examples of that. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think a lot of these claims are, are sort of thrown out there um, and they seem striking on sort of first nominal inspection, but once you drill down on them, you know, maybe it's not as much of a rallying cry as, as you might think. Now, to spend just a minute or so on the first issue about throwing everything under the sun um, into, into antitrust policy, you know, one of the problems with doing so, and I think this was at least part of Tim Bergen's concern, and, and sort of a more general concern of, of, of economists throughout the years, is once you throw everything into a policy, now of course, you know, bureau, uh, the, the, the bureaucrats and the, and the agencies, you know, they only have limited resources, right? And so you've got to reprioritize once you've got a lot more things that you're sort of targeting. And that repri repri uh, you know, creating new priorities um, actually sort of leads to the possibility that you're going to sort of target things maybe not for sort of merit-based reasons, but more for political type reasons, right? Um, you know, if we sort of take off some of the constraints and say, do everything you want to do under antitrust law, um, how are we going to sort of um, keep the, the administration and keep the regulators as accountable as if we have sort of a more strict standard like consumer welfare? Um, one last point, uh, you know, the, it's not just the Biden administration through uh, its executive order, the new sort of uh, chair at the FTC, uh, Lena Khan, sort of a, a rising star in the new antitrust movement, um, you know, is really is really sort of doubling down on this idea that we ought to be doing a lot more uh, through antitrust law, and has in fact, um, you know, as you suggested earlier, uh, gone back on uh, some earlier FTC policy determinations that um, the FTC would use its sort of nominally very broad. Uh, Section 5 authority under the FTC Act um, to take on a lot more of these uh, you know, inequality type things, labor type things, and so on and so forth. So, so we really do see a lot packed into um, all of the uh, components of, of antitrust uh, going forward. And, and that worries me a bit. Well, this is a, a, a great start to a conversation and I want to encourage the panel members certainly to uh, interact with each other, but also encourage members of the audience, if you have questions, to enter them into the Q&A portion, uh, type those in and we will get to questions from the audience in a bit. So uh, I encourage you to do that. But let me turn back, uh, Herb, to you and uh, ask you, you know, wh whether given this understanding of the problem here, whether this executive order is uh, getting the priorities right, I guess, as, as John is, is saying, there's certainly 72 priorities that the president is putting forward, uh, quite unusually in a way, also putting them before independent agencies like the FTC. The language in the executive order is carefully drafted, 
simply to encourage uh, these independent agencies like the FTC and even the FCC to uh, consider policies, but uh, it's not a direct order, but clearly it is setting out a range of priorities. In the antitrust field, uh, do you think this is where the priorities ought to be? Uh, yeah, thank you. More or less, I do. Uh, the things that Biden, the, pre the president's executive order emphasizes, certainly mergers. We've got a lot of empirical studies of recent mergers that suggest uh, our standards are, are too tolerant. Uh, we also have a lot of evidence that uh, there are certain types of mergers that we're not going after because our current merger guidelines don't cover them particularly mergers that are intended to eliminate competitors, that is, mergers as exclusionary practices rather than collusive uh, practices. So I agree with those things. On the digital platforms, the word breakup never appears. Uh, it's, I would say the emphasis is where it should be, which is to look for anti-competitive practices things that it does mention are things like most favored nation clauses. Amazon uses them, for example, to ensure that its rivals charge higher prices than Amazon does. Uh, Facebook and Google have somewhat analogous con contracts with their advertisers. Uh, and I think that's where the Sherman Act can do a good job. Uh, we've got good tools. We've been doing those things a long time. And furthermore, we remedy them with focused injunctions that stop the conduct without doing unnecessary harm to the structure. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, if what the FTC ends up doing in the future, and there's no guarantee of that, uh, and, and of course we've got some new legislation that may be passed uh, down the road, but if, if what the antitrust agencies do in the future is limit themselves to non-structural injunctive relief to eliminate anti-competitive practices and uh, put pressure on them to stop uh, buying up potential rivals uh, just in order to keep new competitive uh, alternatives from emerging. I think we can do go a long way to making those markets more competitive without impairing uh, the efficiencies or the network effects that have made so much of that market so valuable. You know, there's nothing inherently bad about the platforms. And one thing about platforms is that they get to be more valuable as they get bigger. And it's not antitrust job to make firms less efficient or to make markets work less well, uh, but rather to make them work more competitively. And uh, one of the areas that the executive order addresses in terms of competition in the labor markets is with the existence of these non-compete clauses, which I gather historically had applied to uh, employees who might have some technical knowledge or trade secrets or such, uh, but now are being found in contracts with um, you know, retail establishments or restaurant chains and so forth. Uh, Joanna is, uh, can you talk about that and maybe put the, the, the non-compete uh, clause provisions of the executive order in the context of this review of the merger guidelines as well? Absolutely. So, you know, just to remind everybody, non-competition agreements are agreements between employees and their employer not to work for competitors after they leave the firm. And usually there are some you know, restrictions in a certain area, geographic area in a certain industry, but it can nonetheless be very limiting uh, for uh, workers. And so you know, these non-competes are very prevalent. So work by Evan Starr shows that about a third of workers have signed a non-compete at some point in their lives. And as you said, this includes uh, many lower skilled workers. And so it's not clear what sort of, you know, trade secrets these non-competes are supposed to protect when we're talking about sandwich makers, uh, for example. And Evan Starr's work also points out, and I think that's important for us to consider the different instruments of regulation that firms can have legitimate interest in protecting, for example, intellectual property. But I think it's a fair question to ask if these non-competition agreements are not too blunt a plugin 
to address this? And don't we have other legal instruments when there is a legitimate interest by firms to protect uh, their intellectual property, for example, uh, to have things like non-disclosure agreements, for example, instead of, again, blanket banning the employee uh, from working for any competitor in a labor market that is already uh, you know, marred by lack of competition, this sort of conduct by firms amplifies the phenomenon by further limiting uh, workers' opportunities. So, you know, so that's, uh, that's an important uh, issue. It also ties into the merger uh, issue. And, um, you know, the order uh, includes a suggestion that uh, the uh, antitrust authorities should consider reviewing the horizontal and vertical merger guidelines. Uh, and consider whether to revise those. And you know, I would think that having a section on labor would be welcome. There's already a section, by the way, on mergers of buyers, which would actually include the case of labor, but it's not very spelled out in much detail how you would address the issue of uh, labor. And in a paper with Herb, we actually go through you know, what you would need to do. And one of the key things we uh, suggest is to have as a presumptive definition of a labor market, the commuting zone, which is, broadly a geographic area where people live and work, as well as a occupation defined at a fine level, like a six digit occupation code, which is something like customer service representative or accountant and auditors or examples of, uh, of occupations. And then you could use a calculation of HHI to predict presumptively, you know, which mergers are likely to lead to um, anti-competitive wage suppression. And I already mentioned that the empirical evidence, in fact, strongly supports that mergers that happened in the past and strongly increased HHI did, in fact, uh, lead to uh, wage suppression. So now, what is the relevance of non-competes here? So if you do this kind of calculation of concentration, and which is going to be here based on uh, share of job postings by a firm or share of employment by a firm. When you do this kind of calculation, you're just looking at, you know, how many, let's say, customer service rep job is this firm posting? What's the share of jobs by this firm and the share of jobs by this other firm? But that doesn't take into account restraints like non-competes so that even though those jobs are nominally available for workers bound by non-competes, they cannot go take this other job because of their contract, you know, their non-competition uh, agreement. And so what we say in our paper with Herb is, Herb is that uh, this non, the presence of such non-competition agreements should you know, uh, lower the bar in terms of HHI of what could be considered non-competitive because again, that means that the actual opportunities for workers to switch jobs are lower than would be um, you know, predicted by a naive calculation of, uh, of market shares. And finally, I want to comment uh, briefly on John's point about enforcement and uh, the role of antitrust and under limited, uh, you know, under budget constraints, essentially. So, you know, uh, the agencies have limited resources to go after, you know, these issues. Well, first of all, I think we should increase their resources, but in any case, resources are not infinite. So there's always a resource constraint, no matter what, even if we're going to increase them. So I think here, for me, a critical point uh, regarding labor is that um, you know, the, the labor enforcement is already, in fact, included in the spirit of the antitrust laws. However, practically speaking, there's been almost no enforcement. And we showed this in my paper with Eric Posner at the University of Chicago. There's been very little enforcement on the labor side uh, on, you know, for anti-competitive behaviors, but there's no reason to think that, you know, there's less anti-competitive behavior in the labor market as compared to elsewhere. And again, there's almost no enforcement there versus the rest. Uh, and thereby, I'm going to put my, you know, economics hat here. There's reasons to believe that the marginal benefit of adding more enforcement in an area where you're doing zero or, you know, close to zero, is that's likely to be very high. And so I think, you know, no matter what the budget constraints are, there's certainly a, a good reason to move towards more labor antitrust enforcement in order to address, uh, you know, anti-competitive behavior by uh, employers. And, and I think, you know, the uh, data strongly supports that point. John, you want to respond to that last point? And I, I also invite Herb uh, afterwards, if you wanted to say more about the paper that uh, Joanna mentioned that you were working on and what implications it has for uh, 
for antitrust law to, to be taking into account the, these labor market effects. Uh, John? Uh, sure, yeah, so in, in principle, the, the um, increasing uh, budgets and, and so you can have more enforcement of sort of the existing standard, um, you know, that's, that's separable from do you want to increase uh, sort of the scope of enforcement. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm an, and, and lots of even the people who are sort of clinging to the last 40 years are perfectly in favor of increased enforcement. Um, I think what, what many of us are worried about is this sort of um, uh, broadening of scope and, and sort of, again, throwing every goal under the sun um, in, into, the, into the mix. Um, now, I do have a couple of, uh, you know, I, I hesitate, of course, because uh, Professor Van Eskew, um, you know, is, is one of the, the, the authors in this area um, and has done a lot of her own empirical work. Um, so I, I only offer these as sort of my own um, concerns about some of the literature um, on, on enforcement and, and sort of non-competes. Um, you know, while the, while the Star paper and, and a handful of, of others of his papers just suggest that these sort of non-competes um, are much uh, more um, frequent than, than we maybe previously thought, um, that work um, and, and mostly none of the empirical work actually looks into how much they're ever enforced. And so there's sort of two enforcement issues. One, you know, imagine I'm an employer and I have this in my contract. Do I go after the, the burger flipper? Um, we, we don't really know how often that, that happens. You know, my own suspicions are, even if I have it in there, I don't actually enforce it all that often, but we really don't know. Um, and then secondly, states have obviously for, for decades um, have lots of experience of, of saying, well, sure, it was in the contract, but we're not enforcing it for all sorts of reasons. And one of those reasons, maybe it's too broad. One of those reasons may be because, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't enough competition in the labor market um, to have it be sort of a fair bargain. And so I do think even if, if the antitrust authorities themselves haven't been doing enforcement, there may be some reasons to think it's not quite as dire um, as, as was suggested. One last, and this is maybe getting a little too sort of technical, um, for, for a forum like this, but I, I've always, you know, wondered um, with the claims that we've heard recently about sort of labor markets getting less competitive, and yet there are a handful of sort of empirical findings out there that don't quite match with sort of the standard monopsony model. Um, so Orly Ashenfelter, for example, has a very recent paper where he looks at sort of increases in minimum wages and finds that they're, um, you know, at, at the low level, fast food level, um, finds that they're completely sort of um, passed off onto consumers which is not what you would expect in a monopsony model, for example. Um, there's also sort of a longstanding labor economist effect where there's a so-called big firm pay premium um, out there, which is also something that you wouldn't expect in a monopsony model. Um, also the trend towards sort of outsourcing and contracting out work um, sort of runs a, a bit afoul to the standard monopsony models. This is not to say that any, any of the things that Professor Baranescu said are, are, are wrong or, or even a criticism of it, but it maybe does suggest that there are a lot of these nuances that we don't quite fully understand and just sort of coming out and saying and declaring labor markets as being uncompetitive or less competitive is maybe a little too quick. Joanna, do you want to respond at all? Um, sure. I mean, uh... First of all, about the non-competes, it's true that uh, uh, firms don't necessarily enforce them, and we don't have systematic data on that, to my knowledge. Um, and also, in many in many states, they are not not enforceable, anyways. Uh, but what uh, even Star's work shows is that uh, workers are typically unaware about whether or not this uh, kind of uh, thing can be enforced, and even those who are aware are still concerned of what might happen if. Uh, you know, they went uh, and worked for a competitor. So I think this kind of interim effects are also important to consider. And, you know, if they wanted to reform uh, non-competition agreements, uh, you know, potentially not for all workers, but for some workers, I think it could be important to think about banning them outright from contracts because you can't necessarily expect workers uh, to know that those things are not, uh, are not enforceable. Uh, obviously, I agree with the importance of state level enforcement and states AG, for example, have antitrust comp competence and you know, can do things in this domain as, as well. It's not just the uh, federal agencies. And then obviously monopsony is more or less prevalent in different markets. And I actually have a paper myself on the minimum wage 
uh, where basically, you know, in the standard competitive model where you don't have a lot of monopsony power, you'd expect the minimum wage to decrease employment because as you make labor more expensive, the demand for labor goes down and employment goes down. Whereas in a market that has a lot of monopsony power, it turns out employment could go up. And what we show is that it, that's exactly what happens in the most competitive markets. We do find negative employment effects in the uh, least competitive markets where there's a lot of monopsony power, there's positive employment effects. And overall, the effect is zero, as many studies have found. So there's definitely you know, variation in monopsony power across markets. And you know, in a way, that's also the beauty of something like antitrust. It's not necessarily you know, one size fits all, but you're going to examine for this specific market and conduct, you know, what are the effects uh, in terms of having, for example, anti-competitive wage suppression? Herb, let me uh, invite you to enter this conversation and also perhaps to respond to John's concern about expanding the scope of, of antitrust into these other realms. I'm curious whether you think the courts would actually countenance much of this expansion. That he's worried well, about. Well, I think they would certainly countenance some labor market expansion. Indeed, in a not too old uh, merger case, uh, Anthem, uh, which uh, condemned a merger between two health networks, Justice uh, Gorsuch, who, uh, Kavanaugh, I'm sorry, Justice Kavanaugh, who at that time was still a circuit judge, uh, faulted the Justice Department for failing to uh, take into account the effects on nurses, uh, suppression in the wages of nurses that might occur when two dominant healthcare networks in one area would merge because that would change the balance of negotiation as between the employers and the employees. Every single one of the antitrust statutes is neutral on the question of, of buyer versus seller. Uh, Section 7 of the Clayton Act covers buyers as well as sellers. The Sherman Act provisions are neutral. The, on, the only provision of the antitrust laws that uh, reference sellers exclusively is uh, Section 3 of the Clayton Act, which covers tying and exclusive dealing. So I don't think there needs to be any legal adjustment uh, in order to go after these things more. And I think it would be quite consistent with the merger law for the government to uh, write broader guidelines that were more explicit about uh, the impact of antitrust in, in labor markets. And then finally, just one other thing we haven't talked about, and that is horizontal agreements, where uh, what the executive order is calling for is pretty much what the Justice Department is already doing which is uh, just this, in this past year, it, it actually uh, went after a criminal indictment uh, against two firms for uh, agreeing with each other to suppress wages. But I think the proposition that anti-poaching agreements or horizontal agreements between competitors to set maximum wages, but the proposition that those are illegal per se is already pretty well established. I want to turn to questions from the audience. Again, invite you also, uh, if you haven't already put a question in the Q&A. The first question actually follows on this discussion a bit about expanding the scope of uh, considerations. Uh, the questioner says, although the focus we've been giving here, and I think in the executive order as well, is on anti-competitive practices, Many practices can be considered unfair without being anti-competitive per se, uh, giving examples of shrink wrap licensing, downstream use limits on products, which might be considered unfair in various ways to consumers or workers. Um, is that something that can be addressed, the questioner says, through Section 5 FTC rules? Uh, would paying low wages even be considered uh, unfair competition? Uh, and uh, is there some practical way for federal antitrust authorities to address the downstream customer losses from anti-competitive drug pricing, for example, notwithstanding Illinois BRIC? Anybody want to take that question? I'll take a shot. Nobody else wants to. Uh, there's always a temptation to 
make antitrust do things it was probably never designed to do. Uh, and that's because the language is very thin, it's expansive, and there's a burgeoning literature out there today about, you know, environmental law and antitrust and using antitrust in a lot of, uh, to solve a lot of different problems. Uh, personally, I think that's a, a way of hijacking the democratic process. You can't get what you want to do through the environmental laws, you, uh, you do it through the antitrust laws. The warrant in the antitrust laws has to do with monopoly and competition, okay? Now, we can define those narrowly or broadly, uh, but you still have to stay within the realm of uh, monopoly and competition. Shrink wrap, wrap licenses, just off the top of my head, pushes the margin if what we're talking about is broad enforcement of form contracts against people who don't have a good opportunity to read them. That's fundamentally a contract law problem more than an antitrust problem. Uh, some of the other things can be antitrust problems. Right to repair is covered in the ex mm -hmm. executive order at, uh, at some length, uh, refers more expressly to, uh, it's a, actually a software problem, right to get access to uh, diagnostic software, uh, but right to repair has actually been litigated under the antitrust laws and in a very famous and controversial 1993 case, Eastman Kodak versus Image Tech, where the Supreme Court held that, uh, uh, that, that independent service technicians had a, an antitrust right to have access to the parts that they needed in order to repair a photocopier, uh, which is just another way of saying, you know, if you think about some of these problems long enough, an antitrust issue will show up. Baggage handling, is it an antitrust problem? If it's unilateral, probably not. But suppose we do a little fact finding and find out that the airlines are agreeing with one another on baggage handling feed, fees. Then we've suddenly crossed into uh, antitrust. And it's always hard to say where those things are going to show up, but they can show up in a lot of places. Another question from the audience uh, asks, uh, in light of the Supreme Court's opinion in Alston versus NC2A, do you uh, think that uh, the FTC should make elimination of non-compete clauses in employment contracts of low paid employees its first priority? Joanna, do you want to take up that question? Yes, I think there's a strong case to be uh, made for the elimination in the case of uh, low paid uh, employees for the reasons that I said earlier, um, you know, because it's unlikely that they would have significant uh, trade secrets. I thought I found the decision of the Supreme Court quite interesting and especially the, the opinion by J Justice Kavanaugh. Somehow I had forgotten her that he wrote that other opinion. So there seems to be a, a thread here in terms of his thinking on these issues where, uh, you know, he says, uh, so, okay, so just to remind our audience here, this was a dispute about the pay of athletes, uh, of uh, student athletes, and the fact that this pay is strictly restricted through an agreement between universities, okay? So that's, that's what was essentially uh, at stake here. And this was litigated as an antitrust problem. And so, you know, uh, Justice Kavanaugh says, well, price fixing labor is price fixing labor. And price fixing labor is ordinarily a textbook antitrust problem because it extinguishes the free market in which individuals can otherwise obtain fair compensation for their work. Businesses like the NCAA cannot avoid the consequences of price fixing labor by incorporating price fixing labor into the definition of the product. So what he's talking about here is that the NCAA says, oh, but this is amateur. Therefore, it makes sense that they are paid less. So that's why it's like, you know, we, we are saying that our business into, is into low paying athletes, you know, competing against each other. And Kavanaugh says like, come on, like this is, this is not a valid argument. And we have to worry about, you know, the consequences of this price fixing uh, for workers' compensation in this field. So um, to me, you know, earlier we were talking about whether we think that this is going to be uh, something that the courts are going to uphold. That gives some indication, at least, that there is uh, uh, 
there are key members of the Supreme Court who are concerned about a lack of competition in the labor market and that therefore uh, certainly uh, some of those uh, moves are likely to be upheld even if they were going to uh, go all the way up to the Supreme Court and I'd be curious to know what my uh, co-panelists might think about this. As, as sort of suggested, right, the MTA case, um, you, you don't really need to expand antitrust law to, to pull that in, right? I mean, that, that's not the kind of thing that I'm speaking about in sort of a broadening of the scope. To, to my mind, that was a fairly sort of direct application. Um, you know, if we were to expand this sort of more generally to non-competes, whether it be among uh, low-wage workers or higher-wage workers, I, I still retain the, the kind of view, as long as it's not collusive, um, you know, across firms and whatnot, you know, the states are well equipped to handle this as a matter of contract law. And there is some value in having, you know, federalism, right? Um, some competition and, and, and that sort of thing and learning from, from states. Um, so I, I do see those as sort of two different issues, actually. Another way of kind of uh, moderating, if you will, between, uh, you know, going uh, all out with some, uh, you know, new strategy case by case uh, with, a, with a new standard versus staying with the status quo is suggested by one of the questioners who thinks, who's wondering if maybe the way to approach this is a little bit less through case by case adjudication and enforcement and changing the standard that way, but, but for uh, FTC or other others to issue more guidelines or guidances to try to uh, clear, clarify, but steer uh, folks in the direction uh, that they want. So would a guidance about uh, uh, non-competes for low-wage workers, for example, be something that might be a, a, a middle ground, if you will, between a rulemaking on that and a flat ban uh, and, or, or just leaving it up, up to the states and the status quo? Uh, another suggestion in the same questionnaire is maybe there's some types of anti-competitive uh, behavior that uh, that ought to be uh, in some sense encouraged? Should there be safe harbors announced, for example, for joint initiatives to deal with environmental or sustainability measures by corporations? Uh, would that be appropriate? Anybody want to comment? Yeah. Um, the safe harbor thing makes me a little uncomfortable. I think we've got better ways to deal with things like agreements to address climate change or something like that, which is we treat them as ancillary restraints, which is if they're, if they're joint agreements designed to produce better technologies uh, or to eliminate certain types of social costs, the antitrust laws are equipped to handle those. So it's not always to say we handle them particularly well. One of the advantages of FTC guidance and rulemaking, if it's under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, is that the Federal Trade Commission Act cannot be enforced by private parties. Uh, that's, that's been true ever since the Federal Trade Commission was created in 1914. And it's a valuable, valuable qual qualifier on the reach of antitrust because most of our bad cases, most of the real serious overreaching and the bringing of frivolous cases come from private plaintiffs. Uh, and, and one way, if you're concerned about over deterrence, uh, is to uh, say, okay, let the Federal Trade Commission do it under its guidance powers or its rulemaking powers, or even under adjudication, under uh, litigation, but limited to Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. And that way, the FTC can uh, condemn a practice without creating uh, the risk of billions of dollars in follow-on private litigation that can fre frequently ruin companies uh, because private plaintiffs are so frequently much less disciplined. In the few minutes we have left, I wonder if um, anybody has comments about particular sectors of the economy where uh, competition or the lack of competition is concerning uh, to people. In, in particular, one commenter asks about the uh, journalism sector, media sector, 
where there seems to be uh, fewer diverse voices, uh, 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 at least in the broadcast spectrum, I suppose. Um, is that an area of concern? Or how about pharmaceuticals and drug pricing, obviously of great concern to a lot of Americans? Are there particular sectors that uh, warrant uh, special consideration? And it is certainly a focus that the executive order has in, in really targeting some sector by sector concerns. So uh, one, one is not so much a sector as, as a general practice. Um, so with uh, Professor Marinescu's um, concerns about labor, you know, the FTC has a long history of, of going against sort of licensing and, and, and state licensing requirements and things like that. Um, you know, that, that presumably, and, and most of these instances, you know, nail salons, uh, coffin makers, you know, those, those kinds of cases, um, you know, would hit sort of the, the lower uh, socioeconomic status um, uh, concerns. So, so there is sort of something that FTC has done for a long time that would sort of help in, in, in those directions. Um, but again, I don't think that really takes much more of, a, of an expansion. That's a pre-existing practice. Right. And I, I should note that that is an area that the executive order also uh, covers and, and takes, uh, you know, seriously as a concern, especially, you know, people who are move, trying to move from one state to the next and they have to re-up their license. Uh, it can be a barrier, as you say, particularly for people at, at lower ends of the SES uh, spectrum. Uh, yes, I just, can I, can I, oh, go well, ahead. No. Sorry, I just wanted to talk about briefly about hospitals uh, and that the research uh, shows, I already mentioned that mergers of hospitals that lead to high concentration suppress the wages of hospital workers, especially those that are specialized uh, to hospitals. So that's a labor concern, but uh, these mergers, the research shows, also diminish the quality of care uh, for consumers. And, you know, given the size of the healthcare sector in our economy, I think that's one sector of interest uh, where oftentimes, you know, we have a conjoint issue in the product market and the labor market that needs to be addressed. Herb, you wanted to... I was just going to pick up on one thing John said, because I, I, I agree there's... There's a fight that's going to emerge here over federalism. This set of guidelines hijacks and federalizes, if, if we follow through on it, some areas that have been pretty traditionally within state prerogatives, and occupational licensing is one of those. Uh, where, you know, traditionally it's been states who decide who needs a license, what the scope of those licenses are. We've got a state action doctrine in antitrust, but it walks a very fine line of saying, we're gonna apply the antitrust laws only when this is essentially private conduct disguised as state action. Uh, but the, uh, the implications of the executive order will reach further into that or could be interpreted to reach further and uh, federalize certain areas of uh, of uh, state policy. For example, uh, several states by statute or by, uh, in one case, even in, the, in their state constitution, prohibits non-dentists from whitening teeth. And everybody looks at that and says, this is an outrageous instance of legislative capture. It is, I'm pretty sure on the merits that it is, but it's not an antitrust job to undermine a state statute or a state constitutional provision uh, just because we, we don't like it. Uh, and uh, that's one, one line I think is going to generate some controversy in the future. Well, with 72 different actions being called upon, I, there's a, easily a dozen reports that are expected by federal agencies under this executive order. I think we're going to see much more action and much more to talk about in the years ahead. Uh, that may well involve uh, conflicts between the federal government and the state governments, uh, and it may well uh, be trying to work out uh, differences across some of these different agencies at the federal level as well, and certainly uh, a tremendous amount of interest by the business community in what lies ahead. I want to thank uh, each of our panel members uh, for their time today and sharing their wisdom with us.
I apologize to the uh, questioners in the Q&A whose questions we were not able to get to, but uh, I will uh, hope that this is just the start of an ongoing conversation. As I said, we will see more action in the months and years ahead. Uh, I think that's unquestionable, uh, an unquestionable forecast probably from uh, what we saw on, uh, on Friday in the executive order. Executive orders do drive uh, attention um, among federal agencies, even, even independent agencies, uh, I think will be moving forward in a direction fairly consistent with at least the overarching concerns expressed by the executive order. With that, I want to thank uh, all of our uh, members of the audience for joining us today. And again, my thanks to the panel members for their time and wisdom. With that, have a good afternoon.